Howdy friends, today we are diving into the fascinating world of procedural texturing through the lens of mathematics. We will start with the fundamentals, learning how to describe computer graphics mathematically, before building our ultimate arsenal of procedural texturing functions. And the best part, I will show you how to create this incredible procedural texture using nothing but the beauty of math. To ensure a smooth learning experience, I have organized this episode into eight progressive sections. You're welcome to jump around if you're familiar with certain concepts. Don't forget to check the detailed timestamps in the description below. Let's get started. If we truly want to grasp procedural texturing, we need a language that is precise yet easy to understand. English might be too vague and programming languages might be too confusing. That's where mathematics comes in, providing the perfect language for our purpose. Underneath all those layers of abstraction, every computer graphics algorithm relies on math. That's why it is the perfect choice. It lets us work directly with the core concepts. Fear not if math is not your strongest suit. Together in this section, we will develop a mathematical language needed to describe computer graphics. There are various objects in computer graphics which we'll often use, so we need a clear way to describe them. For instance, when creating a parametric procedure, we need to tell the end user which parameters they can use. Let's examine some of the parameters of the procedure we'll be creating later on. Parameters CL and CH should represent colors. But what exactly does that mean? How do we describe color mathematically? Do you want the user to provide a real vector of three values between 0 and 1, or a vector of three natural numbers between 0 and 255? In this section, we'll develop the tools to answer these questions with precision. Mathematicians enjoy using objects to describe concepts. In math, an object is a broad term. It could be anything, like a point in space, triangle, or even a whole polygonal model. We'll be using simple objects like numbers. You should know the fundamental number systems. Natural numbers, integers, rational numbers, and real numbers. Each more complex than the last. The game in math involves using simple objects to describe more complex ones. To illustrate this, let's take two integers, minus 2 and 3. Dividing minus 2 by 3, we get minus 2 thirds, a more complex object than minus 2 and 3. However, just combining numbers with arithmetic operations doesn't give us much creative freedom. So let's introduce a handy tool. A tuple is a mathematical structure that lets us group objects in an organized manner. Tuples are denoted with standard braces and their elements are separated by commas. Each element can be any mathematical object, even another tuple. Inherently, tuples don't represent anything specific. It is about the meaning you assign to them. For example, let's consider this tuple of three real numbers. There are countless ways to interpret it. We could think of it as a color. This particular yellow-green color, if we interpret it as an RGB color with values between 0 and 1. But we could also see it as a point in 3D space or even as a direction vector. By the way, we'll be using tuples of only real numbers quite often. To simplify our work, we'll treat real tuples as real vectors. This means a couple of things. First, we'll use vector indexing notation. We'll have p1 equal 3 fourths, p2 equal 4 fifths, and t3 equal 0. Second, we'll allow ourselves to perform vector operations on real tuples as if they were vectors. This means that we can do vector addition, scalar multiplication, and more operations, which we'll discuss in later episodes. As we continue on our journey to develop a precise language for computer graphics, let's move on from tuples to sets, which will allow us to further specify parameters and objects. A set is another mathematical structure. Unlike tuples, sets aren't ordered so we don't know which element is in which position. Sets only specify whether an element belongs to the set or not. The simplest notation 
first set is to use curly braces, like in this example. If we interpret the tuples inside the set as colors, we have effectively created a set of three colors, red, green, and blue. To indicate that element belongs to a set, we can use this notation, which essentially says that C is element of S. To denote the opposite, we can use this notation to say that C doesn't belong to S. Looking back at our procedural texture example, we can now say that CL lies in S and CH lies in S, meaning each of those parameters has only three possible values, which we have specified in the set S. By the way, another useful notation for sets that might come up is the subset notation. For instance, set M, which contains only the red color, is subset of set S, which we denote like this. This means that every element of M is also an element of S. If this wasn't true, we could use not a subset notation, which looks like this. Now we have a very precise way of describing parameters of our procedures. But there is one problem. Our method of describing sets themselves is now limited to listing out all of the elements, which is highly impractical. So let's explore some ways to describe sets more cleverly. One tool that can help us describe sets are intervals. You may remember them from high school. Intervals represent sets of real numbers bounded by two values. There are multiple types of intervals, but the most common one for us will be the closed interval, particularly the closed interval between 0 and 1. Such interval contains all the values between 0 and 1, as well as the boundary values of 0 and 1. For definitions of other intervals, feel free to pause the video. Using the closed interval, we can precisely define the set of all possible roughness values in a principal shader. Recall that roughness in principal shader ranges from 0 to 1. By writing that R lies inside closed interval from 0 to 1, we have elegantly written information that would otherwise require an entire English sentence. Intervals alone are good for building sets of numbers, but remember that we want to create sets of tuples, for example, a set of all colors. Let's see how we can do that. As we continue exploring mathematical structures, we'll now look at the Cartesian products, a powerful tool that lets us create sets of tuples, which will enable us to create sets like the set of all colors. The idea behind Cartesian product is to combine multiple sets to form a set of tuples containing their elements. For example, let's take the following three sets, R, G, and B. The Cartesian product between these three sets is denoted as R times G times B. The result is a set containing the following four tuples. To be precise, the resulting set is a set of all three tuples whose first element is from R, second from G, and third from B. We can interpret this set as a set of four colors. Notice that we didn't have to specify any individual color, just the building blocks, for which we already have a neat tool. Try to pause the video for a while and think how would you create set of all colors using Cartesian products. Let's create a set of all colors together. The way to do it is to utilize intervals. We can write the set of all colors as C is equal to close interval from 0 to 1 times the same interval times the same interval. However, this seems quite lengthy, so we'll take it a step further. When Cartesian product consists only of sets that are all the same, we can use the Cartesian power, which is just a shortcut for the Cartesian product. So writing C is equal to close interval from 0 to 1 to the third power is the same as writing the interval three times with the cross symbol between them. By the way, the most common use of this notation is when we are talking about certain n-dimensional spaces, like 3D space, which can be described as real numbers to the third power. The same goes for 2D space, denoted as real numbers to the second power. To summarize this section, we have learned how to talk about computer graphics using the language of mathematics. Now that we have a precise language, we're ready to talk about how we can manipulate computer graphics objects 
using mathematical functions. Functions are extraordinary problem solving tools that are vital to computer graphics, especially for procedural texturing. However, they might appear daunting when you're not familiar with them, which might dampen your curiosity. In this section, we'll delve into various types of functions that extend beyond what you might have learned in high school. My goal is to help you build confidence in using functions, so you could truly appreciate how incredible they are. Before diving into more advanced functions, let's briefly review the basics. The functions most people are familiar with are single variable functions, which take a real number as an input and produce another real number as output. For instance, the sign function. The notation you're probably used to is writing f of x is equal to sine of x. This explicitly tells us how to assign output values to input values using a simple equation. The issue is that these functions aren't directly applicable to our needs. The input of our texture map is usually a point in two or three dimensions, and the output can be virtually anything. Thus, we need to develop a more generic concept of functions. Let's take a brief look at how mathematicians view functions. They think about functions in a more abstract way, requiring only three components to construct a function. A set specifying the domain a set specifying the codomain and a rule that assigns a single element of the codomain to every element of the domain. To make this more tangible, let's examine a concrete example of such generic function. Let P be a set of points. We can see it as the corners of a square in two-dimensional plane. Now, let C be a set of colors, representing red, green and blue. I will visually specify the rule using elements of the sets and arrows. We usually assign a name to a function, so let's call this function f. When we want to explicitly mention that the function has domain p and codomain c, we write it like this. If you want to read it, you simply say that f maps p to c. Once we have the function labeled and defined, we can use it like a typical function you're accustomed to but with different inputs and outputs. For instance, we might create a function g, which maps real numbers to the second power to the closed interval from 0 to 1 to the third power, which could be a function mapping points on 2D plane to colors. However, specifying rules explicitly for every point and its corresponding color isn't feasible. That's why we will explore more effective ways to define function rules. First, let's address the problem of creating rules for functions that accept vectors instead of real numbers. More precisely, we want to develop rules for functions of the form f maps x to real numbers, where x is a certain subset of real numbers to the nth power. These functions are called multivariable functions. Fortunately, the solution is quite straightforward. We simply extend our single variable function rule notation. For example, we can specify function g of x and y like this. This is a function of the form g maps real numbers to the second power to real numbers. The only difference here is that we have used two variables instead of one. We cannot visualize the entire multivariable function the same way we do with single variable functions. So we have alternative methods to do so. My favorite way is using height field. In this example, the height field is a 2D surface in 3D space where the X and Y coordinates correspond to the input and the Z coordinate corresponds to the output. Here I treat Z as the vertical axis, which is standard in mathematics. The next logical building block is to create a function that accepts a real number as input and outputs a vector. More precisely, we want to create a function of the form f maps x to real numbers to the nth power, where x is certain subset of real numbers. In this case, we'll once again draw inspiration from single variable functions, but this time we'll modify the right-hand side of the rule. 
For example, we can specify a function g of t like this, which is a function of the form g maps real numbers to real numbers to the third power. My favorite way of visualizing vector valued functions is by drawing curves in space. This particular one represents a spiral. By the way, notice that we're essentially specifying each coordinate of the output individually. This leads to a useful idea when creating such functions. Instead of thinking about a function as a wall, we can consider it as three separate functions. g1 of t is equal to sine 5t, g2 of t is equal to t divided by 2, and g3 of t is equal to cosine of 5t. Then we have two different ways of defining the function. This way of thinking about vector-valued functions is essential, because it effectively simplifies the problem. Now, let's merge our notions of multivariable and vector-valued functions to create multivariable vector-valued functions, my personal favorite. We will be creating functions of the following form, where f maps x to real numbers to the nth power, where x is a certain subset of real numbers to the nth power. For instance, we can specify a rule for such function like this, which is a function of the form g maps real numbers to the second power to real numbers to the second power. There are multiple ways to visualize such functions, like viewing them as a vector field. Here is a question for you. How would you use multivariable vector-valued functions to create a diffuse color map? I will provide an answer later in the video. When working with functions, it is helpful to know some basic techniques for tweaking their behavior. By using a simple equation, we can transform a function f of x into a new function g of x with different characteristics. The equation looks like this g of x is equal to a times f of b times x plus c, and then we add d to the entire expression. The parameters in this equation control different aspects of the transform function. For example, changing the value of a stretches or shrinks the function vertically, while changing b does the same horizontally. Adjusting the value of c shifts the function left or right, and d moves it up or down. Being able to manipulate functions like this will come in handy when we start creating procedural textures later on. Throughout this section, we've delved into various types of functions, beginning with the familiar single variable functions and progressively expanding our understanding to general functions, multivariable functions, vector-valued functions, and ultimately, multivariable vector-valued functions. By examining each function type, we have learned how to represent and visualize them effectively, which is invaluable for tackling procedural texturing challenges. We also explored ways of transforming functions, equipping ourselves with additional flexibility when creating procedural textures. Now that we have established a solid foundation in functions, we're ready to move on to the next section and continue our exploration. As I have hopefully demonstrated, complex functions are usually created by combining simpler functions. In this section, we'll focus on building a toolkit of simple functions, which we'll treat as building blocks for our more complex functions. It's important to note that during this series, we'll be using some functions which are usually taught at high school curriculum, and I won't describe them. However, there will be an exception. I'll talk about sine and cosine functions for a bit since they're of special importance to computer graphics. For the rest of high school functions, I've left some resources to learn them in the description below, so if you're not familiar with them, feel free to check out the description. Trigonometry is usually studied during high school, and explaining everything in detail would take far too long to do in this video. Therefore. I will assume that you have at least some understanding of the trigonometry, and I will just give you a refresher. The most fundamental functions in trigonometry are the sine and cosine functions. More complex trigonometric functions are then built out of them. There are many ways to define these two functions, such as the unit circle definition or the right triangle definition. 
It is useful to have multiple definitions in your mind since each definition can help you in a different context. A few fundamental pieces of information about these functions. They are periodic for both sine and cosine function. Their domains encompasses all real numbers and their values range from minus one to one. There are countless relations between D2 functions. For instance, the phase shift relation, which says that the sine wave is equal to the cosine wave shifted by pi divided by two. One important information that you might not know but is important for computer graphics is that computing trigonometric functions numerically is very slow. Computers have limited precision and for most values of trigonometric functions, they just give you an approximation, not a precise value. Don't worry, the approximation is usually more than good enough. But the points to remember is that it can be a bottleneck of your algorithm's performance in some scenarios. Euclidean distance is a concept that you are probably familiar with, even though you might not know that it is called that way. During your analytic geometry classes, you learn that to compute the distance between two points, A and B, you can use the distance formula. Visually speaking, this formula represents the length of straight line connecting those two points as was taught by Euclid. Therefore, we sometimes call it the Euclidean distance between two points. We can utilize our function notation and create a function that computes the distance between two points. I will call it DE, meaning Euclidean distance. We can define it simply just by plugging in the formula like this. This function takes in two points in space and outputs a non-negative real number. If we fix one of the two points in place, we can create a graph that depends on only one of those points. For instance, the function f of x and y, which takes in a point in two-dimensional space and outputs distance between the input point and point zero zero, which is also called origin. If we take a vertical slice to the origin of the graph, we get an absolute value function. What happens if we compose the distance function with a cosine wave? At the vertical slice, this gives us a function that looks just like the cosine wave, as cosine is symmetric along the vertical axis. However, more interesting things happen with the entire graph. We now get a pattern of circles around the origin that go on forever. Did you know that we can generalize the Euclidean distance to any number of dimensions? If we want to compute the distance between two points in n-dimensional space, we can use the following generalization. Notice that our previous definition of Euclidean distance is just a special case of this formula when n is equal to 2. For instance, when n is equal to 3, we get the following formula. And you can continue to extend this formula into any number of dimensions that you might need. In procedural texturing, we often need to create sharp transitions between different regions of a texture. One of the most fundamental tools for achieving this is the step function, denoted by the capital letter S. The step function takes two real numbers as input and outputs either 0 or 1, depending on whether x is less than a or greater than a. By varying the value of a, we can alter the graph of the function. We can now apply the step function to create interesting effects. For example, by plugging our trusty cosine wave into the step function, we obtain a new function that takes on values of either 0 or 1, depending on the height of the cosine wave. Varying the value of a changes the width of the 0 and 1 intervals. Using our previous example of computing distance, we can create something more interesting. So by defining function f, which takes two-dimensional point as an input like this, and plugging the result into all three RGB coordinates, we get a pattern of circles that changes color and transitions sharply from the center. Moreover, by altering a, we can get various different results, not just one. The pulse function, denoted by capital letter P, takes three real numbers as input, 
and outputs either 0 or 1. In the graph, we are treating the last two variables as constants. Defining the pulse function is very similar to defining the step function. However, we use three inequalities instead of two. If x is smaller than a, then the output is zero. If x is between a and b, inclusive, the output is one. If x is greater than b, the output is zero again. An example of how to use the pulse function is to create a square shape. Suppose that we have a square defined by two of its corner points. The lower left point with coordinates x1 and y1 and the upper right point with coordinates x2 and y2. We can now define function f which takes in two dimensional point as an input as the product of the following two pulse functions. The function is one whenever the point x, y lies inside the square and is zero otherwise. This can be seen by looking at each factor individually. The minimum and maximum functions are two closely related functions that take two real numbers as inputs and output a single real number. The minimum function denoted as min outputs the smaller of the two input numbers, while the maximum function denoted as max outputs the larger of the two numbers. One useful application of these two functions is to combine two other functions. For example, we can combine the two sine waves with different frequencies and amplitudes using the minimum and maximum functions. We will explore more interesting applications of these functions later on. Sometimes we need to limit the range of our functions. One way to do this is by using the clamp function. We will be denoting it with a symbol C. This function takes three real numbers as input and outputs a single real number. The definition of the clamp function is quite simple. Given an input value of x and two threshold values a and b, the function returns a when x is smaller than a, returns x if x lies between a and b, and returns b when x is greater than b. Let's say that we want to use our distance function and the sine function to generate diffuse color map. However, the output of the sine wave lies in the interval minus 1 to 1, while color values lie in the interval 0 to 1. To overcome this, we can use the clamp function to limit the output of the sine wave to the range 0 to 1. We can now use the function to drive color coordinates. Next, let's talk about the floor and ceiling functions, which are widely used in computer science and have a special place in computer graphics. Both functions take a single real number as input and output integer, essentially converting real numbers to integer according to certain rules. We have a very nice notation to remember then. The floor and ceiling function are defined as follows. The floor of a real number is the greatest integer less than or equal to x, while the ceiling of a real number is the least integer greater than or equal to x. Due to the way they are defined, they are sometimes referred to as the least integer and greatest integer function, respectively. For example, consider the height field graph of the function f. This graph illustrates the practical application of floor and ceiling functions and brings us closer to what we aim to achieve in our grand finale. In later sections, we'll explore more sophisticated uses of these functions. Now, let's talk about the modulo function, which is a crucial building block for many procedural textures. The modulo function takes two real numbers as input and outputs a real number. However, the second input number cannot be zero, visually apparent when you see the definition. The definition of modulo function goes as follows. First, you take the number x and divide it by a. Then you take the floor of the result, which discards any reminder. Next, you multiply the result by a, which scales the function according to a. Finally, you subtract the result from x. The result is the remainder left after the division. Note that the definition requires a to be non-zero, since division by zero is undefined. The modulo function is extremely useful for creating custom periodic functions. By applying the modulo function 
to the input of a function, you can make it repeat itself over a certain interval. We will explore this idea further in later sections, but for now, this is just a simple demonstration. In computer graphics, there are usually multiple ways to achieve a certain outcome. This holds true when defining functions like step, modulo, and others. While I have presented definitions which are widely used and easy to understand, it is important to keep in mind that there is no one correct way to define these functions. If you are using a software or programming language, be sure to check out the documentation and learn how are those functions defined in that exact context. However, using the definitions I have presented and a little bit of programming knowledge, you should be able to program those functions on your own. One more thing to mention is that the notation for the presented functions isn't standardized across the board. So it's important to be flexible and adaptable when working with the functions. And with a bit of experimentation, for sure you will be able to master them. Picture this. You're working with an animator who wants to create a smooth spiral animation for a spaceship. However, he has decided to manually compute values for every eighth frame, resulting in animation that looks like the spaceship is teleporting every eight frames. How can we save this? The answer is interpolation. Interpolation is a mathematical technique used to estimate values between given data points. It has applications in a wide range of fields, such as computer graphics, animation, and data analysis. With the right interpolating technique, we can turn our spaceship animation into a smooth, almost perfect spiral. While I won't be able to cover more sophisticated interpolation techniques in this video, I'll give you an overview of the two most commonly used types, linear and cubic interpolation. Linear interpolation is the simplest form of interpolation. The idea is to draw a straight line between two points in space and use the points on the line as an approximation. In 2D space, linear interpolation is defined as a function with two points and a value between 0 and 1 as inputs. The output is defined like this. When alpha is equal to 0, output of the function is equal to a, and as we increase the value of alpha, the output of the function gets closer to the point b. Note that the values used to multiply a and b sum up to 1. Our formula is also applicable to n dimensions, with the difference that instead of using two-dimensional input, we use n-dimensional input. Linear interpolation in one dimension, which could be also called linear interpolation between numbers, is a noteworthy special case that we will be using quite often. When we interpolate between two values and grab the interpolation function from 0 to 1 in the variable alpha, it looks like a line segment. Linear interpolation can also be used for color interpolation. However, the problem with using linear interpolation between RGB values is that the RGB color space isn't uniform, which can result in some values being well distributed while others are not. Cubic interpolation is more sophisticated than linear interpolation and is often better suited for many tasks. In the given formula, in this section, represents a specific type of cubic interpolation, called Hermite interpolation. Other types of cubic interpolation, such as Cadmerone and B-spline interpolation, may be more appropriate for different use cases. The baseline for Hermite cubic interpolation are two cubic polynomials, 2t to the third power, minus 3t to the second power, plus 1, and minus 2t to the third power, plus 3t to the second power. Both of these polynomials are positive on the interval from 0 to 1, and they always sum up to 1. We can now define Hermite cubic interpolating function using this formula. When we grab the interpolation between two numbers with varying alpha, we can clearly see that the interpolation is much smoother than the linear interpolation. So there you have it. Two common interpolating techniques, linear and cubic interpolation. While they might not always be sufficient for certain tasks, they provide a good foundation. The linear interpolation is computationally simpler, 
but the cubic interpolation can provide smoother results. For those interested in learning more about interpolation, check out the resources in the description below. In texturing, functions like step and ceiling can produce sharp transitions, which can lead to aliasing. Aliasing is a class of visual artifacts that can reduce the quality of our images and animations, ranging from mildly annoying to completely destroying our image. To combat aliasing, we often use smooth functions instead of sharp ones, which we'll cover in this chapter. When we denote a smooth function, we'll use the tilde symbol to differentiate it from its sharp counterpart. For instance, the smooth variant of step function will be denoted with tilde s. This is done to avoid any confusion. This notation isn't standard by any means, but it seems visual enough to me. Smooth step will be essential for us. We will use the tools we've built already to create the smooth step function. And then we'll use the smooth step function to create smooth variants of other functions. Let's take a step back and look at the step function we have created. The function suddenly switches from 0 to 1 when we reach the point A. Our goal now is to create a function that doesn't do that. Instead, we give it two points A and B and the function gradually changes from 0 to 1 in the interval from A to B. Luckily for us, we've got a perfect tool to do that, cubic interpolation. Using cubic interpolation, we can interpolate between two numbers. We want to interpolate between 0 and 1. When we grab the interpolating function, there is one problem. The domain of our function is from 0 to 1, but we want it to be in the interval from A to B. Using our function transformation toolkit from the third section, we can easily solve this problem. We have to do two things. Stretch the function to be in the domain from 0 to B minus A, which is the distance between A and B, assuming that B is greater than A. Then we need to shift the function to begin at B. We will do this in two steps. First, we'll create a function f, which is the stretch variant. Now we create function g using this formula. This is the cubic interpolation in the correct interval. When we expand g, it looks like this. Then we can simplify the entire expression to this form. This forms the foundation for the smooth step function. Now we are ready to define the smooth step function as a piecewise function. I will denote it as tilde s. And we will define it as 0 when x is less than a. When x lies between a and b, including a and b, it will be equal to our expression. And when x is greater than b, it will be equal to 1. This gives us an extremely valuable function that is quite simple to use. And now you understand why the formula looks like this. We can now apply it to one of our earlier examples to get rid of the sharp transitions between stripes visible in the circle pattern. After constructing the smooth step function, creating smooth pulls becomes a much simpler task. We'll use a clever trick to achieve this by utilizing the smooth step function itself. Let's first clarify our objective. We'd like to create a function that takes a real number x and four points on the real axis, a, b, c, and d, where they follow the inequality relationship a is less than b, b is less than c, and c is less than d. We want our pulse function to be 0 when x is less than a. Then smoothly transition from 0 to 1 within the interval from a to b. Maintain a constant value of 1 within the closed interval bc. Smoothly transition from 1 to 0 within the interval cd. And finally, maintain a constant value of 0 when x is greater than d. The good news is that we can use two smooth step functions to accomplish this without resorting to a piecewise function. We'll simply define tilde p using those two smooth step functions. When we plot this function, it precisely matches our desired behavior. The underlying principle behind this approach becomes evident when we compare the two smooth step functions side by side. 
Now we are going to explore the smooth variant of the ceiling function. Our aim here is to replace the sharp, discontinuous transitions of the original function with smooth ones. Think of it like having cubic interpolating curves instead of those abrupt jumps and being able to control the width of the smoothing interval from 0 to 1. We'll introduce a parameter t which allows us to control the smoothness of the transitions. To create a smooth variant, we need a periodic function that has a transition interval in the area where the step is constant. To do this, let's use the modulo function as our baseline. We will label it with f. Now, using the smooth step function, we can build a function g from it. Where t represents our smoothing parameter, which ranges from 0 to 1. The function looks like what we wanted to create. Next, let's create function h, which adds back the staircase pattern. This gives us the smooth ceiling function. But there is a small issue. It's shifted by one half. So finally, we can create a smooth ceiling function by shifting it one half to the right. When we expand the expression, it looks like this. This is our final smooth ceiling function. The smooth floor function is indeed very similar to the smooth ceiling function. And we can create one from the other. Since we've already created the smooth ceiling function, we can now derive the smooth floor function from it. The transformation is quite straightforward. Just shift the smooth ceiling function one unit down. In this section, we have explored the concept and applications of various smooth functions, including smooth step, smooth pools, smooth ceiling, and smooth floor. Not only do these techniques provide solutions to practical problems, but they also offer an insight into how you can create smooth variants of your own functions. With the foundations in place, we are ready to apply everything we have learned in the next section. We have reached the grand finale. Now it's time to put our mathematical toolkit to work and create procedural texture from scratch. Designing procedural texture is an exciting process and having clear mental image of the final result helps guide our choice of tools and techniques. Let me share with you the texture I want to create. I must admit, I may be cheating a bit since I've already developed the procedure, but having a visual reference is much more effective than attempting to draw it from scratch. Our goal is to create a texture featuring waves. These waves won't be smooth. Instead, they will have distinct levels based on the height of each component. We want these steps to be of equal width and have a smooth transition between them. To make the waves more visually interesting, they should be slightly distorted rather than perfectly straight. For this texture, I envision the following parameters. Two color attributes, one for the lowest step and one for the highest step. A parameter to control the amount of wave distortion. Another for the number of stripes, one for the wave width, a parameter for displacement, and finally, a parameter to control the smoothness of the transition between individual levels. So, how do we bring this vision to life? My usual approach is to first focus on the larger patterns and add detail later. Also, whenever possible, it is better to start working with single variable functions. We will begin creating the stepped wave as a single variable function and then extend it to multivariables. The most prominent feature here is the overall rising and falling wave shape. We can create the large waves using either trigonometric functions for a smooth appearance or modulo for a spiky and more regular look. I'm going for the second option. There is a clever trick for turning modulo into a triangle wave. Shift the modulo function by half of its height and compose it with an absolute value. This way we get the triangle wave pattern. But remember, we have parameters that we want to use to drive our procedure. So let's create a parameterized version of the triangle wave pattern. We will define the triangle wave function like this. The w inside modulo ensures that the width of our waves is according to our parameters. 
When we subtract w divided by 2, we move it down by half of its height, allowing the absolute value to create the triangle wave pattern. By multiplying it by 2, we ensure that the height of the wave is equal to its width, w. However, it is easier to deal with the function when its range lies in the interval from 0 to 1, so we will divide it by w, ensuring it stays within that interval. Now let's add steps to our triangle wave function. Floor and ceiling functions both seem like ideal choices here, and we can use either one. I'll go with the ceiling function. Recall the graph of the ceiling function. If we want to have n steps, we need the range of the triangle wave function to be between 0 and n. We can achieve this simply by multiplying the triangle wave function with n. When you look at the graph, we can see that the lowest and highest levels of the wave are longer than the other levels. We can solve this simply by adding one half to the ceiling input. However, we then have to subtract one from it. So the lowest wave starts at zero and the highest one ends at n. As you can see, this is almost what we want. The only issue is that we don't want sharp steps. Fortunately, we've already created a small variant of the ceiling function, so we can use it. We can swap out the ceiling function for our smooth ceiling function using the parameter b to control the smoothness of the ceiling. As you can see, by adjusting it, we can achieve smoother or sharper transitions depending on what we desire. One more improvement we can make is to ensure that our values range between 0 and 1. Currently, our values range between 0 and n. We can simply solve this by dividing the entire expression by n, yielding the following formula. Let's take this to three dimensions. I will grab the function as height field, where we will use function f of x and y is equal to stepped wave of x. This looks somewhat similar to our target, but we're missing a few details. Let's now focus on the deformation. We can deform the wave by deforming the input space of the function f in the two-dimensional plane. This might seem a bit abstract, so let me break it down. Consider a flat grid as the input space of the function f. Each point on the grid corresponds to a specific output of f. Now let's deform the grid while keeping the values assigned to the points the same. By applying the deformation to the grid and then graphing the height field, we achieve exactly what we want. So let's see how to actually do this. Let's create a new function called deformed wave. This function will accept 2D points and output number. The function will be defined like this. This is the exact deformation of the input I applied to the grid. We have essentially pushed the x coordinates right or left, depending on the value of y. Expanding the expression, we get the following formula. Now that we have the foundation of our texture, let's do the fun stuff. Add color and control displacement. First, Let's create a diffuse color map. We'll call it TC, and it will be a function which maps real numbers to the second power, the closed interval from 0 to 1 to the third power. We've got our two parameters for the color of the lowest wave and the highest wave, and also we've got linear interpolation for colors. Creating the texture is as simple as invoking linear interpolation. By doing that, we get the following formula. This was quite simple and adding displacement is even simpler. We'll call the displacement map TD, and it will be a function that maps real numbers to the second power, the closed interval from 0 to 1. We will define it like this, where h is our parameter controlling the amount of displacement. By playing with these parameters, we can achieve a wide variety of stunning results. And the procedure relies entirely on mathematical functions without any primate algorithms. You've got to admit, it's quite beautiful. Congratulations on completing the second episode in my series on procedural texturing. We've journeyed together from the absolute basics of describing graphics to multivariable functions.
and finally to building our own arsenal of procedural texturing functions. But this isn't the end, this is just the beginning. Now you're ready to explore the limitless possibilities of mathematics in your workflows on your own. I'm thrilled to announce that the next episode will be about creating shapes for procedural texturing using purely mathematics. You won't want to miss it. So make sure to subscribe and stay tuned for the next episode.